This is going to be a bit of a rambling talk in the sense that uh, it's going to span quite some period of time. I do call it a trip down memory lane for a reason that will become obvious as I, as I go through this. Um, this will be soon upcoming my 30th total solar eclipse and I am motivated here not so much as a professional astronomer, which I am, but as somebody who's addicted to chasing the moon shadow. And if there are people who have not, particularly the students who have not seen a total solar eclipse yet, you have to make it a goal of your life, hopefully your early life, because it is a truly, truly amazing phenomenon. The chasing of eclipses has evolved in the 40 years or so that I've been involved in doing this. And in this talk, I, I actually want to reflect a bit on the things that we take for granted um, in eclipse chasing today, things that are easy for us but are, have been much more difficult in the past, and how things have evolved over some period of time. So I was here once before uh, in Delhi in uh, 1995 when the total solar eclipse occurred in this part of India. Just looking for my pointer here. And I have chased eclipses by sea, by land, by air, and here in India by elephant. And uh, whatever you have to do to get to the path of a total solar eclipse, people will do. I, I raised in the abstract this question, um, are eclipse chasers, are we a cult or a culture? People have sometimes asked me that. And so I call uh, two definitions um, that appear in the current version of the Oxford English Dictionary um, as a cult is, is devotion or homage to a particular thing paid by a body of professional adherents or admirers? Well, that certainly sounds like eclipse chasers. Uh, in a broader sense, a culture the distinctive ideas, customs, social behavior, or products, or a way of life of a particular society or people. That's us as well, or a group of people subscribing or belonging to that. Eclipse chasers are very passionate about these things, so we may be both a cult or a culture. Which are we? At the end of the talk, I'll try to answer that question. But I think the one thing that everybody who's seen a total solar eclipse agrees is that this is the most awesome and awe-inspiring natural phenomena that exists here that we can be privileged to see on Earth. And seeing a total solar eclipse once gets under your skin, into your body, and into your spirit. And here I'll be talking more, perhaps, from an aesthetic perspective than from a scientific one. But it is something that you definitely have to see. But to do that, traveling is absolutely essential. And making a choice on where to travel is important to try to find clear skies. Um, this is a list which you may or may not be able to read of the 29 total solar eclipses that I've traveled to see. Um, in red, I've been clouded out several times, which is extremely painful. Uh, technologies exist today, and people with knowledge, like Jay Anderson here, uh, help us understand the weather situation and how to avoid that. But this is predicated on technologies that have evolved in the past decade, in the past century, that we all are reliant on today. So to get this hour and a half of totality is a lifelong endeavor, and it's a lifelong endeavor of many of my colleagues and friends here in the audience today. Of course, in antiquity, we've heard already in this conference that uh, for most of the span of humanity, eclipses have been viewed as ominous portents of evil, and this seems to be transcultural. Eclipses were things to be avoided, to be shunned. Um, I, I won't dwell on the many, many um, instances that we've seen this through history, there are classical ones that people repeat. There's the, uh, back in uh, 2134 BC, there was a total solar eclipse that it's apocryphally reported that two Chinese astronomers literally lost their heads over for not predicting it accurately. Um, if you go to the, to the Bible, there is uh, quotations in the book of Amos that indicate just how dreadful and fearful the total solar eclipse was. This passage, I'll cause the sun to go down at noon and darken the earth in the clear day is believed to refer to a total solar eclipse, and you can see you'll turn your feasts into mourning, your songs into lamentation, bring sackcloth upon your loins, horrible events, total solar eclipse. And as we've heard elsewhere, that uh, people have um, dropped their weapons in battle when the, when the lunar shadow has passed over them. Uh, there's a recorded case during the uh, Lydian War, for example, that uh, immediately during a total solar eclipse, the battle ceased looking for peace because it was an ominous portent. But things have changed. Today, and going back several centuries, there's uh, people who intentionally chase the moon shadow into the path of totality, and that's a relatively new endeavor in, the, in, in human history. 
Um, this really started exploding in some sense, but in a limited fashion, to professional expeditions um, that really began in earnest in the 1700s. Uh, the eclipse of uh, 1780, there was an expedition from uh, Harvard College uh, that occurred during the American Revolutionary War. This was one of the early professional expeditions. Uh, they mounted the best instrumentation that was available, telescopes, multiple telescopes, accurate clocks, thermometers, micrometers. There was a whole scientific program plan to try to understand um, phenomena associated with the total solar eclipse observationally. Uh, this was during the Revolutionary War. The path was behind uh, enemy lines, and so special circumstances were made to get there, unfortunately. It was miscalculated a little bit, and they saw a partial solar eclipse, not a total solar eclipse. Now, nobody was beheaded for that, but there was a, a bit to pay to the War Department as a result of that. But for most people, eclipses were still serendipitous. They occurred locally. Um, there was an eclipse in uh, 1871. This actually preceded, the, as we heard before, the, the discovery of helium on the sun during another total solar eclipse, uh, this in, in Bikel, India. Um, the same decade, in uh, 1878, in the United States, there was an eclipse seen in Colorado, but the reactions by people worldwide were pretty much the same. Um, people were not chasing eclipses, they happened to be swept up and caught in the path of an eclipse. But professional expeditions were on. In the same eclipse, where um, the totality was seen locally, the British led an expedition and started carrying more and more I want to say complex, but better instruments, better telescopes, um, better measuring devices. And it became sort of a standard for every eclipse expedition to supersede the previous one to try to find out more about the sun. The physical nature of the sun was really not well known. And so this became a, an endeavor of increasingly complicated expeditions. That same eclipse was seen from Cape York in Queensland, Australia, where many of us will be going next year. And we'll hear from Joe Kelly and, and um, uh, and cuddle about this in, in their talk, the eclipse coming up. But here was the expedition in 1871 to Cape York, uh, setting up and observing totality. About the turn of the last century, 1900 by then, very large instrumentation was moving into the path of totality. Here was the Smithsonian Institution expedition. Um, and uh, you can see here that uh, there are some very large telescopes that were used. Uh, this is a 38 uh, foot long focal length telescope used to uh, try to get uh, high resolution images of the sun and also to look for planets orbiting interior to Mercury's orbit. And there's a, a horizontal fed by a mirror 135 foot long focal length telescope that produced images that were 15 inches across on the photographic plates they were taken. So very high resolution instruments even at the turn of the last century. And probably one of the most famous eclipse expeditions that led to several follow-up was a testing of the general theory of relativity, which predicted the general theory that as light passed near the edge of a massive body, in particular the sun, space-time would be distorted and the gravitational metric would change so that the position of the stars behind the sun as seen from the Earth would appear to change. This was looked for and actually observed by the Eddington expedition, but it took several other eclipses to confirm it, including another one to, to Australia in 1922. So this was the sort of age of, of big glass, big telescopes to do big science to understand what was going on. But there were three, what I consider, transformational technologies that were developed last century, in the course of the last century, that really made it easy for all of us to become eclipse chasers. And this is kind of a personal perspective and on, on my feelings of what those three major advances in technology were. The first is the airplane. Uh, 1903, the Wright brothers invented the airplane, and this, of course, uh, was a foundation for many of the things we can do in terms of transport, and I'll get into some of the details of that. The second is Modern Rockets by Robert Goddard in 1926. We don't often think about rockets in terms of eclipses directly, but you'll see the connection in a moment. And the third was this device. Any of the students recognize this device? That was the transistor. That's right. This is the first transistor invented in 1947, which revolutionized, of course, everything that we do here today was predicated on this device in terms of the microelectronics that we use today. So the airplane, of course, provided an easy, rapid, global deployment. We could go anywhere relatively easy, relatively inexpensively, and move expeditions and equipment around the world, amateur astronomers can travel. I understand that space is uh, hopefully planning an expedition uh, to the 2012 eclipse and chartering an airplane. This is what made it possible. 
Uh, you can get above the clouds, you can go fast and prolong the duration totality, and you can use it as a method to move from one location to another if clouds are on top of you. You, you don't have to wait um, for you know, good weather hopefully coming. Uh, you can go and seek it yourself. And of course, it gave us a high altitude platform to observe eclipses from as well. Being up 40,000 feet gives you a very different perspective. Um, modern rockets themselves, there have been eclipse experiments deployed from sounding rockets and such, but more they provide a mechanism for deploying assets into space for us to use. And those that eclipse chasers rely on are weather monitoring, which informs forecasting that's done today, and of course modeling, which is extremely important to understand the global dynamics of weather. But it has to be observationally driven, and this was only possible with modern rockets. Today we sort of take that for granted, but that's, uh, that's a precursor for that. Global positioning and precise navigation. You don't want to end up behind enemy lines not seeing an eclipse again. Everybody walks around with their pocket GPSs and GPSs and their cameras and on, on, by their wrist watches by the next year. Um, this is a new technology that was enabled only by modern rockets. And of course, instantaneous global communications. When you're out in the field somewhere doing eclipse observations and you need to call back home or get support or find out what's going on, uh, your, your satellite telephone or LinkedIn through an internet or cell network through communication satellites gives you this global reach and glo global access. And of course, space assets also give you a look not only at the sun, but back at the Earth. And here's a different sort of view of two eclipses in 2003. You can see the oblique shadow of the Earth over the Antarctic, uh, as we heard about the Antarctic 2003 eclipse before, and higher in the sky, casting a more circular shadow on the Earth these are MODIS satellite pictures looking back at the umbra transitioning the Earth. So the transistor has given us all the electronic devices to follow. Um, here was the original transistor in 1947. Here's an iPhone, an old one. It's a 3G. Um, adding up uh, all the equivalent transistor circuits, there's uh, somewhere in the order of several billion today in a modern device, and it gives us the capabilities that we have. So um, I'm going to talk just a little bit because I think it's important about understanding the evolution of this transistor technology over the, the first 30 years or so. Um, the, the, the focus was in packaging, reliability, making these things smaller, making them less power hungry, making them faster. And by 1961, people were walking around with pocket transistor radios. That's what the transistor was known for. But the next year, uh, 1962, was the first packaging of the multiple of these devices sort of hooked up together that uh, developed what was called TTL, transistor, transistor logic. And this was the foundation, the early foundation for switching in computer circuits that we use today. By 1971, these TTL circuits that had two, four, or six transistor-like elements in them had gotten up to several thousand. And this was the first microprocessor, I'm showing a picture here, it's the Intel 4004, which had 2,300 transistors. This is the very first microprocessor and started a revolutionary age in computational ability. Um, engineers, computer scientists today talk about Moore's Law. Moore's Law basically says if you look at transistor technologies as it developed over the years, there's a doubling power in terms of the number of transistor elements every 18 months inexpensively as processors are developed and electronic devices is developed. And why this is important to eclipse chasers is because this has given us an ever-increasing capability and portability of the devices that we use and the reliance on infrastructure that may, has become available through the application of Moore's Law really an explosion of devices available in Eclipse Chaser's hands that were not available just a generation, certainly two generations ago. So from the transistor, we've got microprocessors, we've got image detectors, we've got consumer electronics that we use for doing high precision Eclipse calculations, we just on our, our laptops, um, generation of circumstances for eclipses, mapping and visualization tools, which we'll hear about from Xavier and some others at the conference, uh, controlling cameras automatically so we can enjoy and watch eclipses and not fiddle around with cameras, reducing images, calibrating them, um, doing the sorts of image processing that can only be dreamed about and was impossible a generation ago. So Moore's Law, the explosion of these devices started with the first processors, microprocessors in 1971, but this was also from a sociological time scale, a change in the perspective of eclipse chasing in the sense that several things happened within a few years of each other. In 1972, the first commercial eclipse cruise was offered, and it was billed as a floating scientific hotel. 
uh, a ship left from, um, from the East Coast of the United States carrying 800 passengers 900 miles east of New York. And this was, this was kind of a revolutionary idea in eclipse chasing. Not individual um, professional expeditions with a dozen people or so, but making availability into the path of totality easy. And this was, uh, be has become an industry that we all expect today. We all take a look and say, well, where's the next eclipse and what cruise am I going to go on? This was a new thing. And it caught on right away. In the next year, 1973, the second commercial eclipse cruise came along. This time, they filled a ship with 3,000 passengers. And there were actually several other ships. And now we expect this completely. There were professional amateur expeditions that had joined together for this very long eclipse, seven minute plus expedition. And this has become kind of a, a theme since then. Professional and amateur for eclipse expeditions have joined together, joined forces. And this has become a, an important thing for us. Um, the Concorde in this eclipse was used as supersonic transport. Aircraft have been used since, uh, well, almost since they were invented for observing eclipses. But this was the first supersonic chase pushing the direction, and the only one that's been, pushing the duration of totality to well over, over an hour for this eclipse. And that fueled the idea for doing eclipse flights. In the very next year, Ansett Airlines offered a Boeing 727 where they took the seats out of the airplane out of Perth, Australia, extending the duration of this eclipse in a regular commercial airplane to over seven minutes getting above the clouds and giving a wonderful view of the corona. So in the same era, 1974, uh, eclipse flights were launched. And this is the same time that, for me personally, and I said this is kind of a personal perspective, that I got involved in computing eclipses. Now, Prior to this time, of course, there were many resources from the Naval Observatory, from a variety of sources, and NASA then had gotten involved in providing um, eclipse calculations for people. But at this time, all calculations had been done on mainframe computers, these things that would fill this debt, fill this uh, half of this room. Um, but I had gotten involved at this era, just before the beginning of the microprocessor explosion, um, doing first computations uh, on these larger computer systems, uh, uh, the IBM 370 and the Sigma computers, but you were really tied to, to doing this in kind of a cumbersome way. Um, in 1974 to 79, as Moore's Law produced more and more powerful sort of uh, resources available to us, computing became portable, and I put portable in quotes, in, in the sense, not in this particular sense, where you can load up a processor and put it on a truck uh, this is a portable CPU because you can carry it around. Um, this is a 16 megabyte memory unit. Uh, for those of you who, uh, well, here's a 16 gigabyte memory unit. So 1,000 times more capable and just, uh, and actually this one's kind of old now. This is not really what I mean by portable. What I meant was that we have small devices that became available, desktop computing, and so migration became possible and really put computing into the power of, of individuals. Um, here, first onto an Apple II in machine language, and then into uh, uh, another desktop computer, uh, a Waterloo uh, language system computer. So by 1985, the power had advanced enough so that actual computational models for predicting eclipses, they were seeking improvements on, in details of things like how does the limb profile, the lunar limb exaggerated here in the mountains and valleys that you see, how does that sculpt the edge, edge of the uh, moon out and affect local calculations? What about the effects of atmospheric refraction? That is, as you look through the atmosphere, looking through the atmosphere itself actually affects how you're, you're seeing the, the path of the eclipse because the, the, um, the sunlight is refracted through the atmosphere. These sort of things get fed into computer models in order to produce higher, higher precision calculations locally. And this is actually important and became very important for this eclipse that occurred the next year, 1986. There was an eclipse which caught my attention when I was um, probably about 13 years old in this classic publication by Jean Mayus and collaborators, their canon of solar eclipses, where this eclipse in 1986, which is an annular total eclipse, was listed as a zero second duration eclipse. At maximum, it was annular, became total for zero seconds, and then became annular again. And this is because the moon's shadow, the apex of it, just barely or maybe didn't touch the surface of the Earth. It was just that perfect confluence where the angular diameter of the sun and the moon were exactly the same size. Um, other computations, and uh, Fred has looked at this independently, and we've talked about it over the years, have shown that this eclipse that occurred in the middle of nowhere off Iceland had a maximum predict predicted duration of just about zero seconds. If you want to split hairs, minus 0.2, so maybe it really wasn't total. Uh, it was only a few hundred meter wide shadow, so it became important to predict these accurately. 
that's at sea level. But if you can manage to get up into the apex of the moon's shadow, which brings you in this particular case 80 miles closer to the moon, um, the shadow gets a little bit wider, but you're closer to the moon, so the moon's angular diameter grows and gives you a little bit more closer towards totality. So we tried to do this using some of these new enabling technologies that have been put in place over the next 20 years. We had the computational power to predict when and where. We had aircraft available that we could use. Um, could we do it? It was a very difficult sort of a, a thing to implement. Um, the uncertainties, the predictions, the methodology was known, but the actual measurements uh, of the moon's limb have not yet really been codified in a way that were, were available very well. Alan Fiella providing this from the Naval Observatory saying uh, this was a new program. He didn't know the exact scale before we we're talking about the scale of the solar system. The exact scale for calibrating this wasn't that well known. Um, the models for atmospheric refraction, there are models, and it changes depending upon what the atmosphere is actually doing. And GPS satellites didn't exist. Aircraft didn't fly by GPS back then. So we took a chance, we did it, and we saw this spectacular event that to this day, I don't know whether to call it a total eclipse, an annular eclipse, a hybrid eclipse, or give it a name. But we saw a ring of chromosphere punctuated by beads, and the time scale from here to here was uh, about eight or nine seconds going from what you might call second contact to third contact, a truly, truly amazing event. And the observation of this was only brought about by the emergence of these new technologies coming together. But this was the mid-1980s, um, and portability continued, capability continued, and I personally got involved in a number of aspects of using these new capabilities um, to make them more available to other people. First, there was a migration into the graphical user environments that were becoming available with, for example, the Macintosh and, and other computers that were starting at those, at those times, making a more user-friendly interface for these sort of things. Um, there was also a real desire on my part to automate taking pictures of eclipses. I hated going to eclipses and being a slave to operating cameras. So the early prototypes were based on earlier generation computers. Uh, this was a 6502 processor, which was a little bit lower down on the Moore's Law curve, but was used uh, by me originally to, to prototype um, a system for automated eclipse photography that I used for the 1991 eclipse in Mexico. And that was relatively easily ported then as an underpinning to, to other developments. In Parallel with that, really portable computers came out, the first laptops in the early 1990s. Um, that made putting these eclipse prediction systems, calculation systems, out of these big mainframes and onto laptops, and you could take them, and in this case, uh, combining two key elements, wanting to watch eclipses from the air to get above uh, nasty weather and get to places when uh, you couldn't see it from the ground because of logistics, <clears throat> with being able to recompute things in situ, actually, in, in response to wind and so forth, and get accurate eclipse predictions and, and fly through it. So this first e-flight software was used in 1992 for a flight with a DC-10 at 41,000 feet, and was able to prolong totality from about four and a half minutes to six and a quarter minutes. And this is the, the same software that had been updated over the years that space um, had used for the, the eclipse flight they had recently done from, from here in India. So at about the same epoch, again, this was all sort of parallel work, was porting, moving this uh, centerline eclipse computation software, hybriding it with the, with the hardware control into a system that uh, ran on laptop computers that could interface with just about any camera and was first tested for my own use here in India uh, the eclipse in 1995, and it, it worked um, extremely well because for that very for short 52 seconds, I was able to watch the eclipse and not have to worry about taking pictures of it, just processing them after the fact. Um, this particular system that I, I talked about at the last solar eclipse conference, I think, um, is now somewhat obviated. Um, Xavier has now a much more, I won't say robust, but more modern version running on Macintosh computers. Um, uh, sort of predicated on this, but he's taken it a step further, integrating it with map visualization and other tools. And talk to Xavier if you want to see the most recent version of this sort of control software. But the, the uh, reason for doing this was for taking multiple exposures in an optimized way for then linearly combining or non-linearly combining these things for high dynamic range imaging that could be done using computational tools that didn't exist before. 
Uh, the Eclipse Flight software was enhanced for use in particular, knowing that there was a big eclipse coming up in 2001 that there was a possibility of using a Concorde for, and that it had not originally been thought that we could actually outfly the moon's shadow in commercial aircraft, but clearly we could with the Concorde when it was flying. So a century made a big difference from 1903 to where we were at the turn of the 21st century, contemplating supersonic flight for anybody to use. There was one in 73 for scientists. And in roughly the same size observing platform, moving these big 135-foot telescopes into little distributed instruments that in some sense could do as well or better for high resolution and other imaging studies. So from this point, I actually just want to talk about the implementation of using some of these technologies for eclipses that I have, have seen and, and done. And as I say, the first we planned was a supersonic flight with the Concorde. Um, there was a maximum duration of about five minutes of this eclipse, but the geometry was such, it almost repeated the 1973 Saros predecessor a bit further south, and we would have been able to chase it for over an hour. If you look at this graph, this is the velocity of the moon's shadow as a function of time. The dotted line here is the cruise speed of the Concorde, and you can see that the Concorde actually can outfly the moon's shadow. You have to slow it down. This would have given us the capability for an hour totality, and actually to adjust the speed of the aircraft and sort of hang the diamond ring in the sky for about four minutes and sit there and watch it. Uh, we were planning on doing this supersonic eclipse flight. We had an agreement with Air France. Uh, we got permission from the uh, governor of Ascension Island to launch the flight from there. And then unfortunately, as many may remember, there was a, the accident outside of Paris in 2000 that grounded the fleet and everybody on board had perished in that. And that was the end of that. Uh, something that we had wanted to do, but obviously we're not able to proceed with. So the plan then instead uh, was to do this from the ground, and we picked an observing site in Zambia in Africa um, off the Zambezi River, a change of idea of what we wanted to do for imaging then. Um, it was very close, uh, 100, only 130 kilometers by road, but the roads were not always so cooperative. Uh, modern technology doesn't help when you have to get there on pontoon bridges and uh, Eventually we got there. Uh, roads were a little bit better than in Delhi, but I'm still, I was surprised by the traffic here, I have to admit. Uh, no traffic there, but hard to get to. And we got to our base camp um, along the, uh, the uh, Zambezi River, uh, upriver to the eclipse site, some of the locals upriver that were keeping an eye on us as we were keeping an eye on them. And then deploying some of this uh, consumer and home brewed and put together in, in small laboratory or, or garage type equipment, with a number of imaging goals that uh, have continued to be pushed, eclipse after eclipse, making things better. We heard this theme before, high dynamic range imaging, um, coronal polarimetry, and actually just taking pretty pictures. So three cameras used, all controlled by uh, one central computer, all available to be done now, all hands off, automatic tracking. And uh, the results of that eclipse uh, with some of the, the local, locals watching what was going on. The second contact diamond ring exactly as predicted as today we just expect. We expect to be in the right place. We expect to be in the right time. Uh, contrast is a little hard on the screen. I have some pictures up on a poster you can see later. It's, uh, the lights make it a little bit difficult to see. The transition, contact two transition sequence taken from this imaging camera. Um, executing this exposure ramp. It's nothing more than bracketing, but being done in a, on a log normal sort of uh, exposure ramp, which is optimal, what you want to use for combining images uh, to bring out the structure over large dynamic range. And in this case, this was uh, with some spatial filtering to look at the inner and, and mid corona. Uh, same sort of thing on a wide field camera uh, to get to the outer coronal regions. That was only sort of for the inner one degree or so field of view. And what used to be done with radial gradient filters laboriously made in laboratories and applied into camera focal planes was now all done digitally by combining these. Um, again, we're using this processor technology that had become available. This was, I think this was pre-Photoshop. There's different algorithms that were used, but basically the same sort of uh, image combination techniques that were used. A particular interest of mine is looking not only at the structure of the corona, but to, to understand the physics of what's going on um, there's another aspect of this is you can do polarimetric imaging of the corona. You can measure the, the, um, the electromagnetic field of the sun by taking polarized images of the sun, just taking a polarized filter, rotating it uh, 60 degrees between images, which gives you a particular view of the solar magnetic field. From that, you can compute what are called the two linear polarization states, which kind of gives you a picture of what the magnetic field is doing in the two orthogonal directions. You can put that together with some computation. Uh, it gives you a measure of the polarization and the direction 
of the magnetic field, and those two together actually gives you a total intensity image, which is like an image of the eclipse, but also measures how much of the flux, how much of the energy of the, the light is polarized in that region. And that actually gives you a map of the electromagnetic field strength and the direction. And this is actually a student experiment that can be done very easily by taking a camera and a Polaroid and just rotating it. And we've got software that this can be done. And this is extremely useful to trying to understand the physics of the corona. So polarimetry is a particular interest of mine. And if people want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk to them about that. Following that, the 2002 eclipse was almost really a purely aesthetic one from, from my perspective. I met Joe Kelly, who's in the audience, and will be talking to us about the next eclipse in Australia. That, that a path was across southern Africa, across the ocean, and ended at sunset in Australia. And there was an opportunity here to see a total solar eclipse very, very close or at sunset at the end of the path. And the desire here was to see low altitude shadow phenomena. What does the umber really look like in the sky when it's viewed from a very low angle? Uh, Daniel Fisher will tell us more about some of his recent experiences with that. The probability of clear skies here was actually very, very good. This is the problem with observing from a, a low altitude eclipse is you're looking through a lot of air mass and you normally would have a lot of cloud. But here in this particular part of Australia near Cameron's Corner, at the time it had been bone dry. It hadn't rained for two years. It's a desert-like environment. It's very dusty, but cloud was unlikely, although we did have some uh, that we had to deal with. So it was uh, about a 3,500-kilometer trip over four days there and back to the eclipse site with a reliance on these technologies that we almost took for granted by this point. The Iridium satellite constellation had been deployed. So in the middle of nowhere where there's no cell phones, we had satellite coverage to call back and get information as, as, as we needed uh, making the trip. The GPS satellite constellation had been deployed. And so again, when you're in the middle of nowhere and you're looking for Centerline and you pull out topographic maps that have nothing on it to sight, it's really nice to get yourself accurate to 10 meters or so just by pulling out your GPS, or I suppose today you could do it with uh, any sort of handheld GPS device. And the visual and infrared imaging satellites able to give us a look from above uh, on the cloud situation. And so these are the sort of integrated technologies that are made eclipse chasing much more tenable. And of course, use of aircraft. Here we were not using aircraft to chase an eclipse, but having them on standby nearby, just in case the weather was bad, which it wasn't. It cleared out as expected, and we had beautiful clear skies. A um, bunch of people, some in the audience here, putting together these te technologies, the cameras, the automated cameras, some new digital cameras were coming online, uh, controlled by a single computer, could run these things much like they were in the, the African eclipse. Um, you know, are we a cult? Are we a culture? I don't know how many people you see doing these sorts of things, uh, putting weird equipment together in the middle of, of the desert in Australia, um, getting ready for the eclipse. Uh, the local folks, the Ogilvies, it was their facility, their, their ranch they let us set up on, and uh, um, it was quite an amazing thing to have uh, everybody join us then. So that eclipse was imaged by these, these cameras. This is the transition into totality. Um, the shrinking of the solar crescent one second apart and the visualization starting of the inner solar corona. And this gold coloration was actually due to the dust in the atmosphere. Lots of dust. We expected that. Uh, it, was, it was actually very pretty, giving rise to this golden corona at second contact. And of course, it was a very, this was a very short eclipse. It was about 26 seconds. But it was a marvelous view down at the horizon. Bengt Alfredson, who's here, took this photograph, which shows the umbra and the perspective of looking down the umbral cone when you're very near the end of the throat of it at sunset. So this is the, the umbra framing the sun, chromospheric light, light from the chromosphere on the horizon. And this is outside of the umbra, which we're enveloped in here at this point. Uh, as third contact approached, it was a very narrow eclipse uh, path, so we had quite a bit of chromosphere, almost 180 degrees. And uh, you can see the transition back in the near 26 seconds after totality um, with the, the diamond ring against the sort of golden corona. Um, pictures of third contact, but what was most remarkable with this eclipse was actually seeing the moon shadow, these are photographs taken by Joe Kelly, who's here at the conference, and you'll hear from him as well. Remarkable series of photographs, in my opinion. You can see the total eclipse here in this, this all-sky camera. This is looking at the whole sky up above you. Uh, you can see the umbral shadow and behind us, outside of the umbral shadow, and it transitioned up because we were at the end of the shadow and the moon shadow was going back into space, and here's the transition, watching the shadow 
over us, leaving not to come back to the earth for, for another 354 days. A truly remarkable thing to actually see, the lunar shadow like this. We had a really very, very pretty sunset, just a pretty thing to watch from the Australian desert. And then 354 days later, we had another challenge. Um, this was an eclipse that was really in the middle of nowhere. It was in Australia, and we heard about how at the Indian Station at Matri, observations were made. There were some amateur and professional expeditions that made it down to Antarctica. But uh, a number of us wanted to see this by air. And so we had a, uh, knowing that the path was visible from nowhere except Antarctica, uh, made a, a flight actually very, um, very appealing in the sense that the, the weather prospects actually were quite bad on the ground and they were quite lucky seeing this at Matra and other places there was an icebreaker that had gotten clouded out and some folks here unfortunately were on that one but they had a great trip down there but were clouded out of that eclipse. So the path of the eclipse went over, this is the part of Antarctica where we ran the flight right up onto center line. Again, using the eFlight software, which had been modified for full compliance for use in a Boeing 747 with its navigation system uh, to interface directly in with the flight management computers. And by now, Moore's Law had given us the capability of doing everything on a single laptop. We could uh, stream uh, video guiding for the cameras that we were using on a, on a gyro platform. Uh, doing eclipse calculations on the fly, providing navigation information back to the aircraft, running timers, keeping track. Uh, this was something that you couldn't dream of uh, you know, tw 20 years earlier when I started, 30 years earlier when I started eclipse chasing. We had to validate the software before actually plugging it in to the flight management systems on the computer. We went down to Qantas's uh, training facility in Sydney. Uh, we ran four hours and half a dozen simulations of various conditions. They said, okay, you can do it. Um, we put together a very simple, in some sense, uh, four camera system on a, on a single platform to image out one of the windows in the flight deck and the whole back of the airplane, of course, filled with eclipse chasers watching this, uh, all autonomously computer controlled with a real reliance now on these technologies. Um, the technology is also a developed image stabilization made possible by microelectronics and microoptics uh, to stabilize the image while pointed out of an aircraft window. Um, the introduction of new low noise CCD devices, and this by now is completely obsolete. You can better devices and the cameras you can buy for $50 off the shelf today, uh, but at the time was, uh, was sort of state of the art. And using um, actually a different technology, these are just reaction wheel gyros, the same kind that are used on many spacecraft today to keep things accurately pointed here just to keep things stable. They're, they're flywheels is basically all they are. And they keep the platform floating like a small spacecraft when suspended on a, on a bungee cord. The question is, where do you suspend the platform from? Um, we, this is the window we were going to use. We noticed there was this sort of space above it. So we asked Qantas, could we kind of do something like this, drill some holes in your airplane? And um, they said no. But we came up with the idea of using vacuum suction cups, a low technology, but actually a very good one. These are just pump up suction cups, stick them on the wall. They work, and you can hang anything from it. Um, we all got onto the airplane, loaded into three separate flight management computers, the baseline intercept plan, um, and away we went for almost a 12,000 kilometer flight, uh, the longest domestic flight in history, because it left and came back to the same place in Australia. Um, beautiful sunrise over the Antarctic. Um, and you can see just when it was at the horizon, actually looking through some cloud. The pilots complained that our flight plan took them looking straight into the sun. Uh, you can see them shielding it, and we reminded them, though, it wouldn't be a problem. It's going to go away in a little while. Um, we had beautiful, clear skies over the coastal pack ice as we proceeded inland. Um, our heading alignment maneuver to get us on track for the, for the um, umbral intercept. 35 degree bank in a 747, which is a really fun thing to do. This is the perspective from on the flight deck. Um, and so throttled up for the totality run, fired up the imaging program. Here's that camera platform being suspended on a single bungee cord behind the pilot's head, which also made him a little bit nervous. And the umber approaching from behind the airplane. And uh, it worked. The imaging camera sequence, everything fired as expected. This is a guiding camera, raw image, processed image, a little bit of uh, additional processing for spatial um, a frequency filtering, getting more information out of the corona. And the point of using multiple cameras is to get different information from different regions of the corona. The CCD camera uh, doing, this is the film cameras we were running. Again, all computer controlled. 
and then later putting these things together with different levels of processing. There's a beautiful image that was done by um, David Finley and um, uh, Milosov Druckmuller from images taken on the aircraft. And so if people ask, can you get good solar eclipse imagery looking out airplane windows, I think the answer is yes. So I'm going to proceed rather quickly here, skipping the rest of these, to show you just two other things. First, the same technologies were applied two years later, modifying the platform for a 32-second eclipse, some call a hybrid eclipse. It was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This required a ship, not an airplane, to get to. Um, we were quite worried about clouds, and we were keeping an eye on clouds using remote sensing, but this actually came down to, the, to just sitting down with the captain and just watching for cloud as we actually had to move the ship at about 14 knots. Same imaging platform that was used on the, on the aircraft, modified a bit, and hanging here from a luggage trolley that I managed to grab for a week. Very close call. Um, as you see, the sun emerged just before totality, but uh, here's an imaging sequence. This is courtesy of uh, William Whitten, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, they collaborated on some of the processing of this with, and what we really wanted here was to see this arc of chromosphere because the moon was so well matched to the sun in its angular diameter. And then, of course, the third contact diamond ring. And one of my interests here was in looking at the interaction between the chromospheric level, the transition layer actually, just above the chromosphere and the very inner corona. So if you take an image of the sun and unwrap it, um, you actually can see it's too low a contrast here, the interaction between the base of the plumage of the, these prom of the um, inner coronal uh, region and the prominences themselves. And the last eclipse I want to show you today is uh, 2006. I don't have time to show you every one. Sometimes you don't have to go to such extremes for eclipse chasing. Um, in March, uh, 2006, an eclipse, many eclipse chasers opted to go to Libya. Uh, we actually opted to go to Turkey. The main reason for that is we identified six airfields across the path of totality so we could relocate if we needed to, if the weather was, was threatening after that somewhat harrowing chase by ship. So we had an aircraft, uh, there's, there's the airport right there, there's center line right there. We could have taken off and actually observed from the air by crossing or going to one of those other airfields. The goal here, if we could stay on the ground, which we did, was time-resolved high dynamic range imaging for looking for high-resolution structures in the corona. Um, the path of the eclipse, actually, though, in this case, was not in the middle of nowhere, but was right on the grounds of a five-star hotel. Um, I joined Rick Brown and his group there, and it was an amazing place because we set up right on a helipad, um, gave us a perfect positional reference. Um, the high dynamic range, this is, the, this is a really heavily saturated and pushed image from the 2003 eclipse. This is a brightness profile. This is just towards the edge of the moon, but it shows you how the brightness drops off as you go out in solar radius. These are in decades, powers of 10. And so there's almost a factor of a 10,000 from the edge of the sun out to about six solar radii in the change in brightness. So in order to accommodate that, the method of I've adopted over the years is to use two cameras, not try to do it in one, to use a high resolution camera, long focal length, um, and low film speed. I was still using film back then, but uh, low sensitivity in order to get into the inner regions of the corona, and a wide field camera to get to the outer part of the corona. And this just shows you when you put two cameras together, um, you really can get a factor um, of uh, more than 10,000 quite nicely by doing a ramp of exposures, going short exposures, to long exposures at mid-eclipse, and another camera offset with different film speeds, sensitivities, and f-ratios. So altogether, you get uh, roughly a factor of 29 from the exposure ramp, uh, uh, from the two cameras being offset, another factor of 67 from the exposure ramp, which gives you a factor of about 2,000 in exposure time across the eclipse. And then the film has a latitude, just as CCD cameras do, of about an order of magnitude or so that gives you a factor of 20,000 imaging. And so across two different times of the eclipse, near mid-eclipse and near the end of the eclipse, you get pretty much the same sensitivities on two different cameras and then can put images together. Um, an automated imaging system, again, built into a piece of luggage to make it friendly for, uh, for uh, security at airports, um, bringing it off to the eclipse site. And we actually operated a third camera by Joel Moskowitz, who's not here today, as an intermediate focal length camera as a backup. Again, all con auto autonomously controlled so we can watch the eclipse. And uh, you can see uh, the results of a uh, high resolution camera. These are actually individual images, as you can actually see the moon moving across during the course of this sort of uh, four minute ish eclipse. The outer coronal camera 
to capture the, the outer regions of the corona, individual exposures. And uh, finally, the, uh, this sort of mid-range camera. And when we put all these images together, just from the different cameras, the, the diamond ring sequence transitioning its second contact um, from the chromosphere, second contact series. You can see the details in the inner corona, both its second and third contact. Uh, the motion of the moon, which you normally don't perceive visually, but if you look at uh, sort of the relative motion during the course of the eclipse, and of course, you never see the thing in the middle, which is synthesizing the two images together, but it gives you a sense of how much the moon actually moves during the course of uh, a typical total solar eclipse like this, and the mid and outer corona. Brown coming up, where he's going to talk about how we use the uh, capabilities for in-flight navigation to exchange to extend this eclipse to well beyond what the theoretical seven and a half, roughly seven and a half minute maximum is to almost nine and a half minutes of totality from clear skies. So the answer to the question that I raised at the beginning, are we eclipse chasers a cult or a culture? I think people in the audience who've done eclipses will agree we'll do just about anything to see an eclipse. We'll go to extremes for building gadgets and contractions to help us watch eclipses. Um, does that make us a cult or does that make us a culture? Well, in the true spirit of Moore's law and, and binary computations, are we a cult or a culture putting this thing through a gate? The answer is yes, we are. And uh, there's a recent redefinition of what cult and culture is, and they're self-referential, which is actually sort of interesting to me. Designating cult, a cult defined as designating cultural phenomena with a strong and often, often enduring appeal to a relatively small audience. Eclipse chasers, as a percentage of the world's population, admittedly, were a very small percentage. But we all have to go out from here and spread the word because this is a pathway not only for fulfillment and cultural aspects, but as a jumping point for all the young people in the audience to think about the future of what they want to do. And, and even if you don't go into science as a profession, um, this can really get you thinking about the way the universe works. We're not fringe and we're not main, we are not non-mainstream. So I will disagree with this and hopefully by the next SED, maybe we can get them to change this definition. So, um, but it does sound like us. And that's my trip down memory lane. Thank you. <laughs>